um, just looking at the time, I'm just wondering, do we want to, you know, continue on with our prop series? But I think it's really connected to the to to to, to those who are are walking anew in their faith in Christ. You know, we're going to do that. We're looking. At, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to try my best to kind of and put together as concisely as I can the book of Isaiah, which is not easy. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and he talks about various subjects. But um, I think that there is one prominent subject that stands out amongst the rest. And I think it's also very fitting for, for Brother Ben, for all of us, you know, who are on our journey and our walk with God. And once again, I want to encourage all of those who are are looking and asking, Lord, where do you want me to go? How do you want me to proceed in my faith and my walk with you? To please, if you want to continue, if you feel uh, uh, something in your heart, you know, Lord, I want to give all and I want to follow you into the waters of baptism, contact one of our elders. You saw them up here. And also, if a church member, contact a church member, and we'll do our best to work with you and to walk towards that goal. But before we begin, I want to invite all of us to close our eyes, bow our heads as we have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and your care and your grace. We ask you, Father, as we are here, Lord, to just spend some moments, Lord, in your word, that you will bless us, Lord. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for Ben's public expression of his love for you, Lord. He was always your child. He was always your son. You've called him, Lord. And now he has publicly declared, Lord, to us and to the rest of the world, Lord, that he wants to follow you all the way. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to guide and lead him through your spirit. Be with him and be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Tough times can either draw us away from God or bring us closer to him. Florence Nightingale came from a wealthy family and was part of the social elite in London, England. However, at age 31, she wrote in her diary that she saw no reason to live except for death, Florence Nightingale. This unhappy young lady then evaluated her life and discovered that she had one desire, one desire alone, to become a nurse and to help others. I applaud her for that, amen? Her parents disowned her for choosing such a socially unacceptable profession at the time. Her mother wrote, we are two ducks, my husband and I, and we've given birth to a wild swan. A wild swan. Florence's mother had a negative opinion about her daughter's decision to volunteer as a nurse in the Crimean War. However, Florence's dedication and compassion towards helping the wounded soldiers transformed her life into a beautiful and graceful one akin to that of a swan. Amen. Despite her mother's skepticism, Florence served heroically for three years, three years before returning home with a new vision for nursing care and hospitals. Her unwavering faith and divine inspiration transformed a suicidal socialite into the pioneer of modern nursing and healthcare. Modern nursing and healthcare. Similarly, King Hezekiah of Judah faced an impossible situation where his life was at stake because of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. People thought he would have to surrender and face exile or death. However, Hezekiah turned to the prophet Isaiah and followed his advice to pray to God. And through the prophet Isaiah, God told Hezekiah to trust him despite the enemy's threats. As a result, the king kingdom was transformed at least for a while. Let's go back to our scripture reading, Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 through 3. Many scholars call Isaiah the gospel prophet. Some say he is the prophet par excellence because of his pictures and visions and things that God revealed to him in regards to the gospel. But here in Isaiah chapter 36 to 39, this is the center of the book. This is the center, and Isaiah doesn't have much narrative. I mean, the prophets don't have much narrative. But here we come upon a narrative, a story of Isaiah in regards to Hezekiah and Sennacherib. So let's go to Isaiah 36, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 36, verses 1 through 3, and if you're there, church, say amen. 
I'm reading from the ESV. It says here, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. He took fortified cities of Judah. And the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shevna, the secretary, and Yoha, the son of Asaph, the record, the record. So what's happening right now in the story? What's happening in Judah? You see, Assyria, according to the text, besieged Jerusalem because King Hezekiah had rebelled against Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. So on the death of Sargon, let's give a little background on Sennacherib. On the death of Sargon and the accession of his son Sennacherib to the throne of Assyria, Hezekiah refused to pay the tribute that his father had paid and rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. But he entered into a league with Egypt. And so because he decided to leave Assyria and decided to uh, come into a league with Egypt, this led to the invasion of Judah by Sennacherib. Oh, you cannot leave me. And so there in 2 Kings chapter 18, and this is uh, <clears throat> if we read Isaiah and if we read 2 Kings 18 through 20, we're looking at about the same story. It's almost, the wording is almost the same. There might be a few little differences here and there, but it just seems to give us a beautiful understanding of the text. And so, Sennacherib took 40 cities, and he besieged Jerusalem with mounds. Hezekiah yielded then to the demands of the Syrian king. This is in 18, uh, 2 Kings 18, verse 14. The king said, pay me tribute, and I'll leave. So Hezekiah agreed to pay him 300 talents of silver and 30 of gold. 2 Kings 18, verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me. The Judean king hoped that by paying the tribute to the Assyrian king, the invaders would leave Judah. However, the tribute aroused Sennacherib's greed, like someone throwing gasoline on a fire. Human nature is very selfish at its core. Selfish at its core. So before the Assyrian attack, negotiations for surrender took place as usual back in Isaiah chapter 36. And the, <coughs> the Assyrian representatives, excuse me, included Sennacherib, the Rabshakeh, this is a high royal official, we're not sure if it's his name or just a title, maybe a name, and several messengers. And on Judah's side, the participants were uh, Hezekiah, Eliakim, Shephna, Yoha, and Isaiah the prophet. And the meeting location was the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. If we think carefully, if we go back into the text, this is the very same spot where Isaiah met Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7. There's an echo there. So in his first speech to the gathered Judean uh, party, the Rabshakeh quoted Sennacherib. And his main argument was, and this is in verses 4 to 10 of chapter 36, his main argument was that the Lord lacked the power to save the Israelites, and that he, the Lord, was no different from the gods worshipped by other nations who were unable to save them from Assyria. Your God is not able to save you because he's just like the other guys of the other nations. And we've conquered so many nations. He also made it a point to speak in Hebrew so he could dishearten all those who were listening. You see, the, the, the diplomatic language then was Aramaic. And in fact, the Judean party said, speak to us in Aramaic. We, we can understand that, but don't speak to us in Hebrew. But he said, oh, no, I'm going to speak to you in Hebrew. See, the Assyrians, they invaded <coughs> the space of Judah, and then they question Judah's relationship with God, and then they have no decorum for political scenes, and they seek to demoralize all. So you know what, we're going to speak in Hebrew because we want everyone that's around us to hear what we're saying. Hear what we're saying. Please notice that the Assyrian tactics are really borrowed from the great adversary of our soul. Amen? Amen. The devil gets into our comfort zones. He questions our relationship with God. Thank you, Cassie. He has no decorum. He has no uh, a way to, to make things easy. He wants to make things hard. And he seeks to deflate our faith in God. That's the devil. We face his attacks repeatedly every day. Brother Ben, not only you, but even us as church members, 
We have decided to follow Jesus. And let me tell you, because of that, we have discovered that we have offended the enemy. Amen. He is offended by our desire to follow God. Amen. He doesn't want that to happen. He, he is, let me tell you, right now he is, for lack of a better word, upset. Amen. Very upset. But that's all right. Keep offending him. Amen. Amen. By God's grace, keep offending him. So when all this happens, feeling regretful and remorseful, Hezekiah sent a message to Isaiah seeking his counsel. This is Isaiah chapter 37 now, verses 2 through 5. And this request was not something that would have typically have been directed towards a prophet, but rather a priest. Normally, they would go to the priest. But here, Hezekiah says, I need to go directly to the prophet. You see, the king would not lie down in the face of the Assyrian threat. Yet he knew he needed help from another source instead of himself. Hezekiah's delegation then, they come to Isaiah with downtrodden faces. But the prophet tells him, do not be afraid because of the words you've had. Don't be afraid of what you've heard. You see, in the moment of attack upon God's people, God speaks courage and hope in the precarious situation. Amen. See, Hezekiah didn't know what to do precisely, but he knew one thing. He must seek the Lord's direction. And so Isaiah tells the delegates from Hezekiah that God will send a spirit to Sennacherib to return him to his homeland. And there Sennacherib will fall by the sword. And the prophet then tells Hezekiah not to be afraid because God will provide a miracle for Judah. Hezekiah received this message only because he went to God. Let me tell you, we will receive our faith inspired and encouraged when we seek the Lord. Amen. And when the Lord speaks into our life, we can walk in his word. The directive inspired his faith and his hope. Only as he sought the Lord could he walk in the confidence of the Lord's sovereign providence. See, the reception of God's word instigates, promotes, produces faith and courage in our hearts. Church, Brother Ben, and all those who are thinking about walking more fully with Christ, I encourage us to ride the wave of God's gracious providence. It will inspire our confidence in our actions. And so the narrative continues by telling that Sennacherib left Jerusalem because the king of Cush, Terhaka, set out to fight Assyria. This is Isaiah 37.9. But before Sennacherib departed from Jerusalem, he sent his messenger to Hezekiah saying, do not trust your God in this momentary reprieve. I'll be back to finish the job. <laughs> Don't think you're off the hook, Hezekiah. I'll be back. And this parting gift, I'm going to put that in quotation marks, moved Hezekiah to take it to the Lord's house, spread it before God, and pray. So this second threat that came back to him, he said, I, I need to go before God. And he went to the house of the Lord, and he spread it out before God, and then he prayed. Now, if we read the prayer of Isaiah, this is 37, verses 16 through 20, there's several elements in the prayer. But let me give you the main point of the prayer. The point is that God, please deliver Judah. Deliver us so that the world can see that you are God and you are God alone. No one else. Because of Syria... <coughs> Assyria has been successful. They have conquered, and in fact, they've conquered some fortified cities there in Judah. But now they're around Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah says, Lord, please let people know that you are God alone. See, Hezekiah is growing in his relationship with God through this, through this difficult time. The enemy is unrelenting and intimidating the Judean king. Isaiah 37, 14 tells us that Hezekiah received it. He read it went up to the house of the Lord, spread it for the Lord, and prayed. Please notice the action, because in Hebrew, the, 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 the center around the action, the, the, around the text is around the verb. The verbs are so important in the Hebrew language. So here, it says that he received, he read it, he went to the house, he spread it, and he prayed. The action is very concise and very decisive. He said, I'm going to do this, 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 and he did it. He did it. He returned to God because God did what he said he would do. Sennacherib was leaving Jerusalem. He was going. He thought he would come back. <laughs> Hezekiah's obvious conclusion is God did what he said he would do. Thus, the unrelenting attack of Assyria pushed Hezekiah to return to this powerful, sovereign, miraculous God, this gracious God 
You know, today we're facing an enemy that's unrelenting, and this gives us reason to return to God daily. Amen. We cannot leave our prayer spot without spending time with God. We know that the devil is on the attack, and he is out to get us. So let me tell you, it is wise for us to just spend moments with the Lord every day. As the devil attacks frequently, we must, as individuals and as a community, frequent the throne of grace to help us in our time of need. Always go to the throne of grace in time of need. And there is never a time when we don't need God. Amen? So Isaiah sent to the king a message of God's sovereignty in Isaiah 37, verses 20 to 29, which is really the center of the book. Uh, and, and, and there in the book, I mean, if you read the text, I mean, I would love to spend time reading the text. I'm just like, you know, we, we have so much to go through. But the, the text is powerful because God is talking to Hezekiah. And, and in this talk, he, 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 first of all, he's mocking Assyria. Uh, the, the essence of God's first line of question, he's asking questions. Assyria, do you know who you are mocking? Do you know who you're messing with here? God has done what no other mortal can do. I mean, sir, you really want to go this path? You really want to, you know, uh, mess with me? Uh, sir, you're, you're out of your league. You're, there is no chance, but you, you really want to do this? And then God tells this prideful yet foolish king, Sennacherib, that he is only in his position of power because of the God of heaven. God is saying, you're only here because I am using you and employing you to teach my people a lesson. You're not here of your own accord. You're not here because of what you want to do. I have orchestrated in such a way that you have come here to teach my people a lesson. This speaks to God's sovereignty and rulership. See, God is on the throne. Amen? Amen. No one else but God. My favorite author says this. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of men. Let me try to cap encapsulate that for all of us here. When we look around the world through history and even today, powers and kingdoms, monarchs, uh, uh, presidents, uh, kings, queens, we think that maybe they have something to do with the reason why, maybe they have a reason why that they are where they were in that time and day. That it is because of their power, their will, mankind has put themselves in a position of power and rulership over the world. They think this. And then she continues, the shaping of events seems, she says, seems to a great degree to be determined by his, man's, man's power, ambition, or caprice. We think that man, that the reason why people are successful, that they're where they're at in position of power, in the government, uh, because they are, they're, they're ambitious and that they have power and they're caprice. But in the word of God, man, hold on, let me break that right there. But... In the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest. Man, oh man. I'm, when I read that, I was like, man, Lord. Who, sometimes we think too much, too highly of, of government officials and, and monarchs and kings and queens. And don't get me wrong, we, we give them respect, per se, presidents and so forth. But let me tell you, it has nothing to do with them. We behold, she writes, above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. We, 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 we got we to catch that. Above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest, human power, human passions, God and what he has, is doing is silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. God is working things out. We think that someone is out of line and, and, and taking things wrong. Well, don't get me wrong, they, they, they are maybe, but let me tell you, God has everything under control. Yes, we have a, I mean, we look at the nation today, and we have problems. I, I, I can't disagree with that. But does that mean that God is not in control? Does that mean that God is lacking power for the situation today? Does it mean that God is, you know, oh God, you're absent, you know, that's, that's deism. God is an absentee landlord that he's got things started and then he's gone and taken off to some golfing event and that he'll be back in another thousand years. Is that who God is? No. 
God is, God is invested in this. And let me give you the proof of his investiture, the cross. If he didn't see us as important enough to invest in us, he wouldn't have died for us. What's the point? But no, God gave all. Amen. He is patiently, silently working out the counsels of his own will. And I'm thankful that the Bible gives us a road map of how God is working things out. So God declares the end of Sinatra. And the sign that will come to pass as an indication that God's word concerning Sinatra would occur is that Hezekiah will eat of the harvest in the first, second, and third year. Because when you, when you siege a, a city, one of the first things you do is what? You take out the food supply. If you starve them to death, starve them to weakness, they can no longer fight. And so, like good soldiers of the, t of the day, yes, they wiped out the land, it seemed like, around Jerusalem. But God said, don't worry, you're going to eat of the land, first, second year. And this is my sign to you that Sennacherib Reb will be defeated. Amen. And so God gave his sign to Hezekiah to encourage the king. Church, God has us. Amen. Ben, brother, brother Ben, God has you. Church, God has you. We are, we, we are in God's sights and love and grace. Satan is a powerful foe, but we have a more powerful God. Amen. Let us wait for his word for our lives. You see, Hezekiah is growing in his knowledge of God. It's a growth, little by little, day by day, growing in understanding God. And we must have the same plan, growing in understanding who God is. Once we know God, we will realize he controls the situation. Once we know God, once we know who he is, we know that you know what, things are under control. Yes, we have a wacky world, but God has everything under control. He's working out his will amid the devil's carnage. And if this is true, we can believe that God will receive or will resolve this great conflict that we're in. Little by little, Hezekiah received instruction, encouragement, situational experience. Yet all of this pointed the king to God <coughs> as a sovereign provider. As a sovereign provider, excuse me. <clears throat> In this chapter, God realizes, or Hezekiah realizes that God is the only person who can deliver him from Sinatra. But this truth came to him as God spoke to him through the prophet Isaiah. Also, God's work in his situation gave him evidence that provided a foundation for his faith in God. Hezekiah received his faith from knowing God through his providential works. He didn't realize this truth quite yet, though, in his earlier life. So, you see, Hezekiah is learning, he is growing. This is where we all want to be, wherever we're at. No matter at what point of our Christian experience, if we were baptized 10, 15, 20 years from now, or even today, we are all learning and growing and walking in our faith of God, in our faith in God. And Hezekiah is evidence of that because in his earlier life, he missed out. He missed out on one point. And so the story of Isaiah and Hezekiah continues in chapter 38. And chapter 38, real quickly, um, it, this, this chapter appears to have happened before God's deliverance of Judah from Sinatra. But how do I know what well, verse 6 says? Isaiah uh, 38, verse 6 says, I will deliver you in this city out of the hands of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. So Assyria seems to still be around at the time that this story happens. This story, are we following you, church? Do we see that? And so here, <coughs> here, um, he, uh, uh, God, uh, uh, Isaiah, has been sent to Hezekiah. He comes to him with the message to prepare his house because he, the king of Judah, will die. You're going to die, Hezekiah. You're going to die. And upon hearing the word, Hezekiah prays and weeps bitterly. He prays and he weeps bitterly. God hears the prayers and tears of his servant, the king. And it's not mentioned here, but in 2 Kings 20, verse 4, 2 Kings 20, verse 4, which is the parallel uh, retelling of the story, 
2 Kings 20 verse 4 informs us that before Isaiah left the middle of the court, God told his prophet to turn around. Man, that's powerful. So here, Isaiah says, Hezekiah, you're going to die. Prepare your house. You're going to die. And so he seems, he seems to walk out of that room talking with Hezekiah. Hezekiah begins to weep and pray to the Lord. Weep bitterly. He is pouring out his heart. And as Isaiah is walking out in the middle of the court, according to 2 Kings 20 verse 4, the Lord speaks to Isaiah and says, Isaiah, turn around and go back to my servant. And so he goes back with the message that God has heard your prayers and tears. Thus God would heal you, Hezekiah. And he would give Hezekiah another 15 years. And from there, Isaiah asks Hezekiah what sign he would like for God to give to confirm that God will grant him. Uh, so Hezekiah, you're going to get uh, 15 years. And the Lord is asking you, what sign would you like to give you assurance that the 15 years will be added to your life? And let me give you two choices. Let me give you two options. Option number one, God will uh, allow the shadow of the sunlight to go, sundial to go forward 10 degrees. Or the other option is that God will make the shadow of the sundial go backward 10 degrees. And so just imagine, I mean, the king hearing that and said to himself, well, as we advance forward, shadow, 10 degrees, I mean, that's not spectacular. I mean, that's not really anything that, that'll be, you know, beneficial. I mean, the, the, the sun is going to go, the shadow is going to go forward 10 degrees. That's automatic. All right. But what if I was to ask for it to go backwards? Now, that would be something. <laughs> Right? That would be something. And, and if it does happen, then I know that God has said he would give me 15 years. And so <coughs> he tells Isaiah, uh, you know what? Uh, go back 10 degrees. And lo and behold, God moved the sundial backwards by 10 steps. Amen. And so I, Hezekiah got this new lease on life. He, when he saw that God performed this miracle, he knew, man, you know what? God is working in my life. God is here. God is speaking to my experience, speaking to my situation. And I don't have to be afraid anymore. He got a new lease on life. And like Hezekiah, we all need a new lease on life. Amen? Because, I mean, our natural human life, as it is, apart from God, is fleeting, painful, and headed towards death. Only God can move us from death into his kingdom of life. Amen? No one else can do it but God. And so the change of our hearts from selfishness to love for God and our fellow man proves to some degree that God is doing something in our life. When we begin to experience a change in our life, where we are no longer walking the way we used to walk, but living and talking and sharing and just experiencing God on a very different place, something is happening in our life. God is working in our hearts. The Bible says when we love God and one another, we can be sure that God has wrought change in our lives. Now, let me give you the words of the Apostle John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. 1 John 4, verse 7 through 8. Here, the Apostle writes to the community there in his time, Beloved, let us love one another. The, the Greek is... Uh, um, the idea is an encouraging command, an encouraging imperative. This is, a, this is an exhortatory uh, command. I'm encouraging you. Let us love one another, for love is from God. Amen. Oh, man, we, we got to catch the insight in the, in the text because the text is so beautiful. Let us love one another. Love, biblical love, agape love, the love that chesed, the idea of that kind of love is it is relational. It sees others as important and valuable. You are not unimportant. You are not valuable. You, you are of worth. And then it says here, the reason why we love one another is for God, love is from God. So in other words, biblical love, agape love, it is something that we mirror because of God. God is loving first. Therefore, we are mirroring God's love. Does that make sense? For love is from God. So in other words, if we are saying that we're Christians and we're part of the fellowship of Christ, a part of that is loving God. And no, I, I should say it differently. It's not a part of it. It is the foundation of it. Love for one another, for love is from God. Now, please, please catch 
the, 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 the theological implication in the text. I'm probably going over time here. Forgive me, church. But it says here, love is one. So love is relational. Love is seeking connection. Love is looking at others and seeing others. And this mirrors God's love. So God is relational, and he is expressing his love to others. But the first community of love, the first circle of love, of an expression of love to one another, it is not God to the world. It is not God to the unfallen beings. It is not God to the angels. It is God within himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we're all part of this community of love. And that this is what is mirrored in the church. What well, should be mirrored in the church? Love is from God. And whoever loves, continue on with John, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Oh, we wonder, am I of God? Do I, am I learning of God? And, and it seems like the, the, the evidence of that is our love for others. And then he continues in a very negative fashion. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. How can we say I love others, uh, that I love God, but I don't love others? Unbiblical. Not scriptural. We cannot say I love God, yet I hate someone. Now, don't get me, get me wrong. We're, we're learning. God is working on our lives to help us, those rough edges that, that we all have. But God is working in our hearts. Day by day, we're learning by God's grace to love because God is love. So here, a communal aspect, we are to love one another. We are to learn to thrive. And so, you know, because he sees God's sign that he will live, that he has a new life, that he will have another experience, uh, Hezekiah burst into an anthem of praise to God, from whom all blessings flow. Chapter 38, you can read that. I, I, I invite you to read chapters 36 to 39 of, of Isaiah when you get home, after you come to our visitation. Amen. <laughs> we have singing visitation at Joplin Gardens at 2.30. If you want to be a part of that, come on out. We, we sing and we share, and we're always blessed by that. And so here, um, he sings praises to God. But Hezekiah has a lapse. And this is just a part of, of, of the journey and the growth of a believer. He is journeying. He is growing. He is learning. The church doesn't always have it all together. The members don't always have it all together. We cannot say, I have it all together, because then we will be liars. There's no question that we, we should say, I am walking in, in, in Christ as he continues to lead, lead me. And then I'm learning. I'm, 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 I'm on a journey as well. And Hezekiah has elapsed because representatives from Babylon came to Jerusalem um, because Merodach Baladon, this is in verse, uh, chapter 39, the king of Babylon <coughs> heard that Hezekiah was ill and amazingly recovered. He heard. And so he sends a delegation of his people out there to Jerusalem. Now, real quickly, because I've, 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 made, I've made a claim that these two chapters, 13 and 39, even though it's after 36 and 37, it seems to occur before uh, 36 and 37. Because if Assyria was surrounding the city, do you think they would allow Babylonian envoys to go into the, into, into, into the city of Hezekiah? I don't think so. And so here, they come. And they come in, and, they, and they, they're there to see um, Hezekiah because they heard that he was ill, but no, man, he, he's recovered. Amazing. Or maybe, maybe, because... Uh, the Babylons, the Babylonians, they study stars and they study natural phenomena. Maybe they caught on to the sundial? Maybe? Just a thought. Possibly that they saw the sundial go back 10 degrees and they're like, oh, something has happened. And maybe they began to search and read and, and find out something. And it, it came from somewhere in Jerusalem. Let's go see the kingdom. And so when the, they get there, Hezekiah shows them everything. He hides nothing. And after the Babylonian envoys leave, Isaiah the prophet comes to Hezekiah and asks these questions. What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? Also, what have they seen in your house? 
And in Hezekiah in 39 verse 4, speaks almost with a bit of arrogance here. I mean, if I'm reading the text, and it, it just seems, he says, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Hezekiah says, they've come here, and I've, I've shown them, I've given them a grand tour of the palace, a grand tour of the land, a grand tour of, of the city, and I've shown them all the treasuries of, e of Israel. You know, Hezekiah is, is learning, amen? And we can't look down on Hezekiah, because I think we're like this as well. But it would have been so powerful, so proper, so inspirational if Hezekiah, you know, hearing that these people, you know, why are you guys here? Well, we, 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 we heard that you were ill, and now you're alive again, that you're almost to the point of death. And maybe, maybe, maybe like I just said, you know, we saw you know, the, the shadow of the sundial turn 10 degrees backwards, and we want to know what's going on. And if Hezekiah was like, the Lord has been good to me. He has, he has given me life. And he has proven that by, by moving the, 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 the sundial backwards, or the, the shadow backwards by 10 degrees. And you've come here to know what that is, who that is. The God of heaven and of earth is alive and well. And he is all powerful. I mean, if this was the response of Hezekiah, he'd be like, yes, praise the Lord. But no, I'm going to show you guys what I got. Hold on. Come in. You see this? You see that? You see my Lamborghini? You see my Bugatti? You see all that? You guys see my, my golden doors? You guys, you guys see all of that? Man, I got it going on, don't I? A bit of arrogance. A bit of pride. Isaiah then told Hezekiah, that all he showed to those Babylonians would one day go to Babylon. One day go to Babylon. This happened, because here we're looking at, this is Jerusalem, and the fall of Jerusalem happened in three stages. 605 BC, the initial attack, 595, and in 586 BC is when Nebuchadnezzar would raise down uh, 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 Jerusalem and take it all to Babylon. Hezekiah, in pride, showed the treasures of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. So this is, this is the growth that we're talking about. Brother Ben, uh, church, this is the growth that we're talking about. We're, we're not all there yet, but we're learning. Here, pride, pride goes before the fall. How much more we need to stay close to Jesus? Self with all this pride complex discloses to us the importance of knowing God right now as our Father. So this morning, church family, I commend us for trusting the Lord by receiving his holy word. Our trust, it comes forth, springs forth from, from an acceptance of who God is. And so we are here because we need God. And the reason is, man, the enemy, man, he is attacking. He is attacking continuously. He is not giving up. He is coming at us again and again. And this supernatural foe has no respect, no respect for us. He invades us, he invades our space, he invades our lives without remorse or shame. He questions our walk with God. He will suggest that God is not our God. He will insinuate that our confession of faith in Christ is unlikely. He will imply that our repentance is a charade. But the enemy has, has no, no decorum for us. The thief cometh not before to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This is why in the face of opposition, we must turn to the source of our help like Hezekiah did, turn to God. Yeah. If the enemy is on the attack, we must be ready for his attack. How? Our defense is not our strength. It is not in us. Our God is our refuge and strength. Yet, this goes without the grain, against the grain of human nature. You see, we desire security in ourselves through ourselves. Thus, a part of seeking solace in God is distrusting, distrusting our selfish nature. We must search our hearts and go to God, give our will to God. From here, we are ready to receive God's guidance and direction because the greatest obstacle to knowing God is not this person or that person or what someone else is doing. The greatest obstacle is self. Yes. Self. And as we receive his word, let us walk confidently in that discovery. Even though the devil continues his assaults on our connection with God, we turn to him who is righteous as a flower turns to the sun for nourishment and life. Because apart from God, we can do nothing. 
And this truth should be our banner that we fly high in the sky. Living under this model makes us better prepared to engage in the great controversy. Since we know that we can do nothing apart from God, we learn to patiently wait for God's word to return to us. Our Father is speaking his word into our situation, our circumstances, and we discover that at the heat of the battle, we can go to God. We can stay connected to God even though the devil is on the attack. Because the final analysis is God is in control of the circumstances. He is working out his will. God is sovereign. But I want to say that God, he is sovereign, but the greatest disposition of God he is gracious. God is gracious in love, and he has us. He has us. The foe is not winning the battle. God has us. He set us for deliverance, and one day soon he will end the conflict forever and ever. So today, this day, we've seen the witness, we witnessed the baptism of Brother Ben, but today we can all have a new life in Christ today. But let me, the question could be, why, why do I need, Brother Yeti, so why do I need a new life? Well, first of all, we're human. <laughs> Our life and existence is fleeting, headed for death, the way we are. We're in a hopeless situation because of sin. I mean, our, 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 our existence as it is apart from God is headed towards one destination, which is death. And the devil knows this, so he is working that angle over and over and over again. But God speaks life into our situation. He's given us this proof of his, mar of his miraculous power, providence in our lives. It is Jesus dying for the ungodly. It is Christ laying down his life for the wretched. The divine shepherd goes to the wilderness to seek and save the lost. The redeemer pulls us from the jaws of death and makes us a part of his community, his fellowship and we live in that and we thrive in that for the glory of God so here we need to praise God amen praise God from who all blessings flow this is why I commend you church I commend brother Ben I commend all of us here this morning let us keep our eyes on God we must always watch Jesus and this is done by spending time with him Looking at the core message of scripture, the core message, the, 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 everything is based on this one beautiful theme. God is love and he loves us. Don't, I mean, we can't let that impact of that vital truth just bypass our senses this morning. God loves you. He loves me. And the reception of this truth inspires our hearts to trust him. I mean. My, one of my favorite books, Steps to Christ, the first chapter is the sinner's need of forgiveness. Is it repentance? Is it um, the life and the work? Well, what's the first chapter of Steps to Christ, church? God's love for man. She begins there. That's where she begins. A truth of knowing God. The true biblical understanding of love as expressed from the heart of God. God's love is there and it shapes our faith in our existence. God's love provides guidance and direction for our journey. It reels in our pride and produces a humble spirit. This profound, deep love shapes our perspective of ourselves and of others. Amen. It is the rocket fuel that, pro that propels us forward in our journey with God. When we live in his love, we seek to walk, talk, and think of him. The love of faith is no longer a task. It is not just checking boxes, and we are pretty good at that. It is not a, a longer a laundry list of proof for others to see. No, when we see the love of God, the, the, the life of faith has meaning. It has depth. It is invigorating. It is sweet. It is exciting. It is longed for. It is a relationship. This is why love from God must be understood and accepted. Because then from there, we're able to see, you know what? This is a God that I can trust and follow. This is why it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Brother Ben, I want to thank you so much, brother, for your step in faith. Amen. You love the Lord. And we have many of us here that love the Lord. And we're all walking in this journey. Let us continue to walk in this journey. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen, church.
I just come and invite all of us to rise as we sing our closing hymn, our closing hymn this morning, hymn 524. Tis so sweet. Persuasion the Spirit brings in. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. Hi friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor. It's time to make your plans and mark your calendars to attend our third annual Amazing Facts Youth Conference. The dates are...